Hello, I'm Tara Grabson. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research and Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University. And I'm also a scholar, a student indeed, of higher education studies and doctoral studies. I am a big believer that we need to have scholarship in this area to ensure our standards remain high and also that we're thinking actively about supervision as a form of andragogy, as a form of teaching and learning. And I'm also very interested in the future of the oral exam in the PhD in a digital age, in a digital environment, and how perhaps digitisation may enhance, may lift the transparency, the accountability and the international standards that exist in doctoral space. And I've got Professor Steve Redhead, the other Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University, with me today. And Steve conducted a very interesting event in the last week, and that was an oral examination at a New Zealand university. Now, all the New Zealand universities now have an oral exam in place. At this stage, about one quarter of Australian universities have an oral exam in place. So the difference is very interesting, I think, intellectually interesting. And of course, I was a bit of a voyeur to that oral exam as Steve was conducting it. I was listening to what was happening and it was a a really fascinating event. And it was fascinating to see how Steve helped the student, helped the fellow examiners, but also helped the institution itself work out and work through what a PhD is and what an oral exam does in a PhD. So good morning, Stephen. Good morning. And could you tell us a little bit about that oral exam? You've conducted oral exams around the world. You've done a couple of Kiwi ones. Tell us, tell us about that as an experience for you. Yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, I was an external examiner for this PhD, which was at a New Zealand university that had connections to um, the UK where the, the student actually came from, PhD student came from. Um, and I was actually conducting uh, my part in the, um, in the oral exam from my home office, which is why you were able to overhear um, the <laughs> thing in real time. I, had, I was external examiner... There were two external examiners from the UK, so there were three external examiners altogether. Mm-hmm. Um, the supervisor, who one of the supervisors was in uh, New Zealand, one of the supervisors was in England, so they were involved in the process. But done by Zoom, by the way, it's the first time I'd done a Zoom. So, so uh, I'd always done Skype before. But yeah, so, so, and Zoom went quite well? Zoom went quite well. Um, once... People got over uh, not being able to, not having a volume turned up or whatever it was, but actually very well. And it was a it was a really interesting experience in general. As an external examiner for this particular uh, PhD, which was was very good and and went through uh, on uh, you know at the behest of all three examiners. Interesting enough, yes, uh, which is relatively unusual. Um, the initial. Um, Process was told to us as external examiners that that if we wanted to, we could um, say we would like an oral exam for the, the student. But actually, because the three all quite independently said that it, it should go through on the basis of reading it, um, there wasn't a need for the external examiners and others to get together for an oral exam. But actually, under the rules... Mm-hmm. Um, because of the, I think the timing of the student's registration or whatever, um, now that university in Aust- in New Zealand uh, does have oral exam. Yes. So in fact, we did have to have an oral exam, um, and there are lots of interesting parts of the process which uh, you know I think are worth looking at for uh, for future reference really for. For how you do this, particularly internationally, we've talked a lot about in these podcasts about internationalisation, globalisation of higher education, particularly doctoral education. And it is interesting that New Zealand, which is uh, you know an important higher education country, is now doing oral exams. 
Yes, and, and it was an amazing experience. So you had English <clears throat> colleagues. Yeah. So it was at the start of their work day. I know, the you, end of mine. <laughs> you did it sort of at about 7.30 in Adelaide I did, time. Yeah. And of course, even later for our, our Kiwi colleagues oh, as well. Oh, 10, 10 so o'clock, yeah. So it was internationalisation in action. It was. But why I think I'm so interested, and I did want to capture this in a podcast, and mm. indeed a lot of our colleagues have asked for me to talk to you about it mm. because it was such mm. an interesting experience, yeah. is when I was listening to it, it was pretty clear to me that the Kiwis didn't know why they were doing the oral exam. They were doing it because it was part of their new process. Yeah. But they hadn't quite worked out what an oral exam was for. So they were trying to work out, well, we all sort of agree that it's a good thesis, so that's great. So why are we actually having this and what are we going to do in this space? Mm. And mm. So it was interesting for me, you know, thinking at some point perhaps in my life Australia may have an oral exam and my god we should have 10 years ago but still hashtag moving on mm. uh, but the interesting thing is it's not just simply a matter of implementing or introducing an oral exam as the New Zealand universities have done you need to do the background work with the administrators and the academics so they know why the exam is being held mm. that it's not simply adding another barrier or another fence you have to jump over which mm. is a little bit how that event appeared that night when you delivered it. I think your experience, I think, carried that PhD oral examination through, that actually you provided some, some content for it on the way through, like why are we doing this? And so in mm. real time, you were able to introduce those elements to help the student work out why it was there. But should we maybe go back one step, Steve? What actually is the point of an oral exam? Mm. Why should it be conducted? Well, I, yes, we're, and we've discussed this in podcasts and podcasts before. Mm. I mean, partly to um, really find out whether the student can defend the thesis. Yes. It's a defence, and that's certainly um, my experience in, in European higher education in, in various forms. Um, and also that you, you, are, you are testing that, that the student... You know, did do this work? <laughs> yes. So it has. So let's go back there. So it has an academic integrity functionality. Mm. So you're actually ensuring that it is their work, so they can speak to it. Mm. But also, if I'm reading you correctly, and I'll, I'll, let's push this a little bit, it also changes what is being examined. You're mm. you're not only examining the script, which is the nature of the Australian examination. You're examining the candidate. Yes, so and whether they can speak. Correct. So you're not only assessing their capacity to do the written work, but also disseminate that research orally. So it actually changes what is being examined. So I think mm. that was what was interesting for me listening to the Kiwi examination is they weren't quite sure yet what was going on because the thesis, because it, you know, it had moved through the, the processes and the mm. policies and the mm. procedures. Mm. This thesis unfortunately got caught between, I think, two systems mm. is what it appeared like. Mm. And so everyone was going, well, what exactly mm. are we doing here? But I just wanted to also note that some great things did happen through mm. that Very study. Much so. All three examiners passed it clearly through. And in real time, you actually talked about, oh, look, should this be, you know, nominated for like one of the best theses of the of year? the university, yes. So three that, that, people could talk about that's it and right. actually agree. That was part of the external examining form, interestingly enough. Yes. So you could tick that. Um, and there was, at the oral exam, with the student not involved... Mm. A discussion of whether that should happen, whether we could find a consensus for um, nominating this as one of the best yes. of the year yes. for, for this university, and therefore the university was being singled out, and also the student was being singled out. And it was interesting that um, all three, quite independently um, of the external examiners, felt that that is what should happen, um, yeah. and. I mean, I haven't come across that before. I must admit that you could actually tick that on the, the form. But it, it was interesting that um, because of the oral exam and the performance of the student in the oral exam and the event itself, I certainly felt very satisfied that there, there was a consensus that elevated this, um, not as an award, but actually nominated it as one of the best yes. theses for that uh, university and I actually s said at one point that I felt it was one of the best that I'd actually read as a PhD for quite a long time yeah. and the other 
external examiners felt the same. So that, that was quite an interesting part of the process. But then again, um, that was more of a discussion at the sidelines. And what really happened was that, um, quite rightly, the coordinator, who was actually from New Zealand, the coordinator of the process, um, who did a great job, was actually um, looking at exactly what the purposes of, of, purpose of this oral exam was. Yes. And at the beginning, because of the unanimity of the, the examiners, um, where they weren't even saying, you know, this is a minor change or anything like that. So this was quite unusual. Um, we we all felt able to say to the student when he came online um, that we we were going to award the PhD. Yes. So we and yes. often in um, oral exams in in Europe that I'd been involved with in the past, we did say that if the student performance had been really really good textually yes um, but that makes it quite interesting in terms of um you're not actually waiting then for the student's oral performance correct so it, it is beautiful <laughs> in that in a time of, of sort of you know heavy you know rubrics marking rubrics and all the rest of it absolutely and i do even though i'm a big believer in regulation mm. i do want international elite Professors, when they're examining a mm. PhD, to use their mm. judgment. Mm. I do. And I know we, when how Big Hello and Nellie Hills, when Nat and I were writing the regulations for Flinders University, yes. we commenced from everything we developed in terms of that policy, commenced from respecting the expertise of the examiners. Yes. So we actually started at the end, so respect the examiners, and then, then every policy we wrote came from that goal. Yeah. So it's not a matter of somebody at the end disagreeing with what the examiner said, oh, well, look, he didn't know what he was doing. Well, I'm sorry, you've nominated this person. Mm. This has been verified and checked through the policies and procedures. Mm. This is an elite scholar. Yeah. So you, you, you can't second-guess the umpire at the end. Mm. You've got to respect the examiner. Mm. And, Steve, I, th I think, you know, Australia really does have to do something here. Australia yes, really I does think it's have a lesson. Move. Because I think the other thing about New Zealand, obviously, I, I worked there. And it was my first job, and I learned a great deal there. And their their professionalism with their their assessment committees, their examination mm. committees, the way in which they handle, for example, uh, the honours results. So their honours dissertations are so professionally handled. They have mm. external assessors. Mm. I remember Wellington and Auckland used to swap. Uh, their honours dissertations between different departments, so it was always incredibly rigorous. Yes, that, this was rigorous and professional. And you I know, thought. I'm used to, as you are, with the British system where we have external examiners who come in and sit in an airless room mm. for a couple of days and literally sign off mm. an, a, you know, an examination committee. If the external doesn't sign off the examination results, they don't get released, right? So yeah. I think those foundational assessment protocols are very useful uh, yeah. going into a PhD. Mm. And in Australia, we're seeing you know, internal assessors, often sometimes the supervisor, mm. assessing an honours dissertation. Can you imagine this? So, mm. you know, so internal assessment for an honours thesis, mm. then there is no external examiner who comes in to then check the work of those internal assessors on an honours dissertation. And then that goes on to be the basis of a, you know, a scholarships committee. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, taxpayers' money are given on the basis of these internal decisions that are never checked by an external examiner. So mm -hmm. in the Australian system, we're lacking that external scrutiny. Yes, I think there were you. lots of lessons you could learn. And also the fact, I mean, just for instance, the um, specificity of the rules relating to or examine at this particular university. Mm. Actually, the coordinator had written to all of the um, examiners, and th this is in advance of the oral exam, yes. and said, um, if, if you've got, uh, have you got any specific questions really outside of the examiner's reports that you've already submitted, and in fact, which the student was shown. Mm. Um, and the, that was a rule, actually, that you asked the examiners, the, what que what questions you were going to ask, and they would then be passed on to the student, yes. so they could prepare for the oral exam. Now that's quite different. Now it's funny. I'm not necessarily in favour. No, of that, but it's I, quite different. So, so it is a way, I suppose, to protect the student, mm. because you and I have both seen 
nuts situations mm. where mm. someone has a brain explosion and goes mm. to do an oral exam and behaves like a, a lunatic. In fact, mm. a year or so ago, you had to come in as a replacement examiner by memory when, did, yeah. when someone had a brain explosion those, in England. Yeah. Uh, and look, you know, but both of those areas are wrong. I, I, I wouldn't be, again, I'd be giving examiners freedom mm. to be robust mm. And if something, and that's why you have an independent chair. By the sure. way, you have an independent chair. So if someone does something mm. stupid, you can actually shut it down. But this to. was their rule. So the mm. student was able to see anonymized ex- external examiner's reports, so they could see the sort of questions that may come up from the reports. Right. But they were also the examiners were also asked, "Do you have any questions over and above?" what is in the examiner's reports that we could tell the student about. Yeah. Now, that, that's, that's an interesting See, and way also of doing the only, it. They've, re- they've released the reports before the oral exam. See, mm. for me, what's mm. it, and this is my final question, actually, is about the relationship between the oral and the written components. See, for me, if, if I was writing regs for Australia, mm. I would release the reports at the conclusion so the student wouldn't see them going mm. into the oral exam because, actually, the oral exam is the moderator or is a part of the mm. exam itself. So you can't have sort of a, a half-pregnant, here, here's the written commentary, then going into the oral. I see them all yes. as connected and aligned. What about you now? Well, I, I think the interesting thing here mm. was what I've already said, which was that there was a consensus um, amongst anonymous examiners, mm. three anonymous international examiners, that this passed. Yes. And therefore they didn't ask. The interesting thing is they didn't ask. No one of us asked for an oral exam. It was a bureaucratic process which... It was a reg, yeah. A reg actually touch. made it kick in. So there wasn't a request for an oral exam, which would usually have been the case, um, for questioning about the thesis that there were, there were doubts about. Yes. There were no doubts. That was the point. So the extra questions were really directed at how could we help the student publish this thesis either as a monograph or articles from it and that actually took up quite a lot of the oral exam now I think that's interesting because that has happened haphazardly in oral exams that I've been involved in and I've certainly done a lot around the world but not as as specifically so in our discussions before before the student came online, mm. um, we did talk about that as a major issue, and it had been mentioned by the uh, examiners because we thought it was an outstanding piece of work, and that it should go into the uh, general academic maelstrom, either as a monograph, yeah. changed a little bit, but certainly as a monograph, research monograph, and uh, and or as articles in journals. And uh, can I say, that's why I'm so proud of you. you. I mean, you are a great examiner and, and it was one of your finest examinations, I think, because you were great on that. You really gave the student the instruction of this can go here, mm. this area can be developed, this mm. area can be a book. Mm. You were just, I mean, it was basically a master class in this is how you move a PhD to publication. Mm. So it was interesting, that became the bulk of this session because, as you said, there was no real verification or checking in this oral examination. And that's why I think, you know, I, I hope that the Kiwi universities learn from that because they've got to you know, make sure it's not just ticking a box, yes. that, that this has a quality assurance function yeah, that's right. rather yes. than the add-on at the end. Yes. The add-on was useful. The add-on was great for the Very students. Very important, actually. But, mm. but actually the examination, I would argue, the oral examination has other variables that should be considered in that. Mm. And, and again, one of the interesting things about it was to say all of this, of course, was in real time with a bit of digital delay. Yeah. And, and most of us were actually working in our home offices yeah. uh, when we're talking about the virtual university. Well, the um, 24-7 workplace. Yes, too, so the you... internationalisation of PhD orals means that, uh, you know, you probably couldn't be easily in your office at work, any of you. And in fact, in, in, in the case of the student and the supervisor in the UK, they were in a, a place of work. Yes, because it was about... T- t- <laughs> Early in the morning, t- 10, no, 10, 10, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock in the yeah. morning. And certainly, yeah. you know, I, as you know, when I was at CSU, I used to run a Canadian campus, mm. of course, mm. in Burlington. And, you know, that, that's where the International Academy does become interesting because I mm. would go into work and mm. do Adobe Connect mm. uh, at 
2 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, quite. Literally New South Wales time, 2 a.m. Mm. in the morning. I would actually do a work day with mm. colleagues coming in and out of my virtual office mm. before the work day kicked in, you know, in Bathurst. So mm. it was a very interesting way to live. And I think mm. how we handle all this, because as you bright said, you were at home, in mm. a home office. Mm. Your colleagues in New Zealand, because it was even later, were in a home office. We're in separate home offices, yeah. So it, we learn also a lot about what the higher education academy in the workplace is going to look like in the future as well. Absolutely, you know. Talk about paperless offices. Well, there'll be brickless offices. There'll be brickless. We'll, we'll be bloody outside. Um, look, Steve, thank you very much for this conversation. And I think it's always good to, to see a process emerging. Mm. It's always good to see sort of a, a process that's in its underwear. You know, it's sort of like it's not quite fully dressed. It's not quite right yet. And I think Australia, if we have our eyes and our ears open mm. and respect the Kiwi experience, mm. and, and we need to recognise that the Kiwis are ahead of us. Oh, definitely. They mm. are doing better than us on this, and we need to learn from the New Zealand experience mm. here. And, of course, it's rare for Australians to ever acknowledge that we're not doing things mm. terribly well. Mm. And I think at the moment in the Australian uh, doctoral space, there's a lot going wrong. As I said, there's some mm. serious work to be done in honours. Because it really seriously worries me that we're giving Australian taxpayers scholarships to students that are not being assessed by external examiners mm. on their honours thesis, because mm. I think that then creates mm. a cascade of problematic standards going forward into the PhD. Mm. And I think the New Zealand experience from honours and above is a very, very successful one. And uh, it was fascinating hearing you and your internationally experienced colleagues mm. help the Kiwis work out what an oral exam mm. could be. And, and it was a you know, genuinely participatory event. I really uh, I mean, just enjoy it. I think it was, a, it was great for the students and it, it, it was a, a really good example of what international participation in in higher education can be like. Thanks, Steve.